If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Russell's Director of Christian Answers. I want to thank you for joining us today. We have a special program today, and it's going to deal with a subject that's important to all of us. It's a subject that, uh, in, that affects all of us in the sense that the religion of Islam is a global religion. And almost no matter where you live in the world, there's probably someone who believes in Islam not too far from where you are. And uh, to deal with this subject, which in these days and times is even more of a concern than in years past, uh, we have a special guest with us today to join us on Christian Answers. That's the name of our program. And we will be dealing with someone who has personal experience in this subject. And our special guest today is the Reverend Salim Masi, a native of Pakistan, born in a small town where he personally experienced persecution from the Muslim population. He was born and raised in Pakistan and lived there for 33 years, worked as an ordained minister in Pakistan, and then relocated to the United States where he continues his Christian ministry in the Lord's service. Salim Masi was never a Muslim, but was raised in the Christian faith and saw Islamic culture from the from this personal perspective. And Salib, uh, I'd like to thank you for being here with us, joining us today. Thank you. I uh, appreciate you uh, taking the time and the effort to be here to uh, share your, in a way, your own personal testimony from personal experience having lived in an Islamic country such as Pakistan. 33 years living there, being born and raised there. I guess there's not too much you haven't seen or know about when it comes to uh, the culture and and the living standards uh, and, and the the, per the personal values and the religious beliefs of the population there in Pakistan. So, uh, with that said, uh, I would like you to uh, kind of uh, for our Western audience, which is mainly the type of people that are watching these shows here in America anyway. Uh, could you kind of uh, Give us a little idea of what it's like. Uh, you personally have never been a Muslim. You were born and raised as a Christian in the Christian faith. What is it like for a Christian living in an Islamic country like Pakistan growing up? Maybe you can give, relate some of your childhood stories or, or, or whatever you like to relate there. What, it, what, what it's like being a Christian in, in an Islamic country like Pakistan? Uh, first of all, I would... Uh, <clears throat> I say that persecution starts from the birth. When I say from birth, I try to back up that statement by saying when a woman gets pregnant, she's being chased by Muslim men. If you're a beautiful girl, married or unmarried, you are in the eyes of a Muslim man. And like when I say I was suffering persecution from my birth because my mother, as far as I remember, good-looking, fair lady, she was being persecuted for her beauty. Not because she was beautiful, because she was Christian, as she had no power. She could not defend herself. And persecution starts right from the birth. So you're, you're saying that a Christian woman, not a Muslim woman, but a Christian woman who is pregnant, and you're saying that Muslim men, knowing that, well, they can't get her pregnant because she's already pregnant, 
then look at her as something of a, a sexual desire for them to fulfill themselves upon. Yeah, it's an, it's an ob object of sex for them. But can they, can they really, I mean, you know, at least in this American culture, there's a lot of, you know, lust of the eyes, as the scripture talks about. Guys are always looking over women and, and thinking those kinds of thoughts. But uh, when you, you talk about the persecution here in, in a place like Pakistan, an Islamic uh, country, unlike America where, you can, where guys can look but not touch, are you saying that they go beyond that situation? Yes, they can go beyond that and do go beyond it by raping them. Okay, so you're talking about actual rape? Yes. But and now aren't there laws against rape in Pakistan? But nobody follows those laws, especially when you're a minority and Christian. There's no law that defends you. For example, if you are raped and you go to the police for the defense or for your protection, they will do it to you. So that one side of the story. The second side is that the, the honor of the family in the culture, the woman, especially the young woman, does not go and complain because that's against the honor of the family. So she keeps quiet. So she's frightened personally and as a culture and secondly as a religious persecution. She's afraid to go to the police and tell the story that she has been raped or forced into sex will go against her because they will say, oh, you had a sex, so you are the criminal, according to the Islamic uh, understanding. And this is part of the Islamic culture where Christians are second-class citizens with no real power or rights. Yes. But if, if it was a Muslim woman yes. that was raped, mm -hmm. suddenly the full authority of the police would be going after the culprit. Culprit, yes. So... Uh, are you saying this is something prevalent or it just happens here or there? Or? Oh, well, it's just uh, prevalent everywhere, all, all east, west, north, south of Pakistan. And there are so many stories that are not even told. I, being a pastor in my country, uh, have so many stories. The, the mothers of the, these girls come to me and cry to me what they have gone through it. Okay, because you were a minister in Pakistan, a Christian minister. Mm -hmm. And so people naturally come to ministers for counseling, advice, a word from the Lord. And help. And so during your years of service there in Pakistan, you had quite a few women come to you and tell you that they had been raped. Yes, definitely. And, and we could not do anything except to help them to grieve and go through that process and pray about it. And that's all we could do because we are afraid to go to the police. So they're just kind of, really all they can go to is a man with the word of God and get counseling because the law enforcement agencies aren't going to help them yes. in this case. And you're saying most of these people were just Pregnant women, or does this happen to non-pregnant women? Well? Non-pregnant women as well, young girls. And according to the Islamic uh, Sharia, if a woman becomes a Muslim, mm -hmm. if she's married, her marriage is dissolved automatically. So many times they abduct the young girls from, from school or from from village where they live, or city, or a town, and make them, force them to become Muslim. Now, I'm not saying every Muslim does that, but in many cases it has happened. Mm -hmm. And I have the, the report from, from uh, uh, done by the CIA, uh, World Fact Book 2001, in which proves that many cases are, happen, or are happening where woman is forced into Islam. and, and they have adopted the girls, young girls, married women, and forced them to have sex. Now, in, in Pakistan, what is the percentage of Muslims, whichever group it might be, either Sufis or Sunnis or Shiites or whatever, uh, compared to Christians? How many, what is the percentage about, or an estimate maybe, of how uh, many Christians? 97.6 or 97% are Muslim population. 
this is majority sunni muslims mm -hmm. and uh, which out of which uh, about uh, 80% population of muslims are sunnis and 20% are shiite muslims see yeah and then about uh, 2% or so are Christians. Yeah, 2% 2, 2 Christians and 1.7% are Hindus. Hindus. Yes. Now, are the Hindus treated the same way as the Christians? Yes. So, basically, anyone that's not a Muslim is sort of like a second-class citizen. Citizen, yes. But uh, how does this relate to, let's say, uh, uh, professional jobs and things and getting ahead in life and business? If you're a Christian... In uh, an Islamic state like Pakistan, does that mean that you can be uh, a top-flight executive at a, a corporate building and have big cars and and uh, a secretary of an office? Or how does it how does it work? Is that second-class citizen transfer over to your vocational uh, situation? It's not written in the law, but in practice, it's very hard for a Christian man or a woman to to achieve that high. Uh, position in the government. For example, after the partition in 1947, the first chief justice was a Christian chief justice of the high court. When Bhutto came and he wanted to Islamize or bring Islam, Sharia in the country, uh, uh, rule of, of, of law, he dismissed him because he said no non-Muslim can be the, the head of the, uh, the, the country's uh, law uh, organization. It had to be a Muslim, so they, mm -hmm. they threw him out. Mm -hmm. But there are some cases here and there which continued from partition time. People were executives, but they continued for some time, and then slowly they were taken off of their jobs. And, and it's difficult to get into the professional colleges, uh, uh, executive uh, positions because you are considered you are infidel you you are a second class citizen you are christian you cannot be the boss right and i also understand from the quran that uh, people in an islamic government or state or where they have muslims ruling over them they have to pay some kind of tax uh, yes. does that also impinge on the uh, amount of finances that a christian would have because he has to pay some kind of islamic tax well Thank God, in Pakistan, we don't have to pay extra jazia, the tax that you're talking about, which in Quran was uh, uh, put on to the non-Muslims at that time. Mm -hmm. But in Pakistan, we don't pay that tax. Mm -hmm. But we pay in other ways. The way I was describing that, not getting good jobs, it's difficult to get good jobs, or admissions in the professional colleges and, and universities, and, and uh, in government, executive jobs is difficult. You will see here and there very few that you can count on your finger, but they have some political connections, and that's how they got into that positions. I got you. So if you're, uh, let, let's start kind of early then. Let's say you're, you're in a Christian family, and they probably don't have the top kind of jobs, maybe more of the menial jobs of yes. society since yes. they're second-class citizens. That's usually what happens. Mm -hmm in that case, but uh, what is the situation, let's say, for a, 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 a kid who's coming from a Christian family and he goes to the public school, what's it like for a Christian going to, let's say, you know, you're going to, to elementary school or something, hmm. uh, do, do you have any experiences to relate there, is there any persecution there, or is everybody just oh, friendly? Very, very strongly, I, my first five years was uh, in, in a Christian school, and then la, um, the high school, we call it from grade 6 to grade 10, which is, we call it, 10, a high school. And that I attended a public school. And I experienced very difficult times of my life. And I could not believe that how you can be a mistreated uh, or, or treated as you're not a human being. For example, uh, I could not eat and drink in the same place, in the same vessels where Muslim kids could eat and drink. I, I was afraid to drink because if I do, they'll beat me up or they'll throw things up on me. I used to beat him up so many times because I was Christian and they wanted me to be a Muslim. So they, they would, they would uh, violently attack you yes. trying to get you to convert to Islam. Yes. And so many times there was one 
kid in my class, he continued with me three years, grade six, seven, and eight. He used to spit on me, on my face. And he says, oh, you dirty Christian, I don't like to sit with me. And he used to spit on my face. And I used to cry and go and tell my daddy. And my dad used to say, oh, you know, what can we do? You know, we are powerless. Uh, we just have to pray for them. And we can, that's all we can do. If, if we, we fight or if we complain, you'll be thrown out of the school and you'll lose your education. And I don't want that to happen to you. Mm -hmm. And I used to cry and cry and cry. And I think that persecution that I went through made me what I am right now. Maybe God allowed that thing happen to me. But that persecution has stayed with me. It is still with me. And I suffer. I cry many times. Even now, when I think of my childhood, I remember one day, uh, and, and I was, we didn't have electricity at that time in my house, and I was uh, lying under the uh, tree for, to you know, rest in the afternoon, and uh, a neighbor Muslim came and he said, and shook me up and woke me up and slapped me and said, why are you lying, uh, put, uh, uh, facing your feet towards the Mac Mecca? Because as a, as, a, as a Muslim or non-Muslim, you're not supposed to sleep your feet towards Mecca. And he beat me up. I mean, this kind of experiences, it, it has stuck with me. I still remember very vividly how he woke me up from my sleep and beat me up because I was sleeping, my feet facing towards Mecca. So, but uh, when you were at school, when you were hanging out Christian tracks and preaching the gospel at the school, uh, they, they let you do that, right? There's no law against uh, preaching Christianity at a Muslim school, is there? Or? Oh, there is. I couldn't speak about Christianity. Uh, my name itself was a witness to them. They knew I was Christian, mm -hmm. but I could not talk about Christ. I could not talk about my religion. I, I, was, I was not allowed to take Christian literature with me to my school. Whereas I had to study Islam or Islamiyat, uh, which I now appreciate that I did because it has helped me to, to know Islam more. Yeah, because you understand what they're thinking and what's going yes. through their mind. Yes. So you're saying that if you had, let's say you're, you're going to school one day and you take your Bible and you try to tell someone about Jesus Christ from a Bible perspective, what would have been the consequence of that? Oh, I can only imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine. I know even being Christian, they used to beat me up if I preached the gospel. I don't know. I won't live, I think. I won't be living by now. You might, you might have uh, experienced an Acts chapter 7 with the, uh, Stephen. Yes, yes, it's possible. <laughs> it was a very dangerous situation. Yes, very dangerous situation. It, it reminds me of what uh, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. He said, don't cast the pearls of the gospel before the swine of, of, yes. of unbelief, yes. unbelief because they might turn and rend you. Yes. Exactly. And I can see that could be a very w real possibility. So in, in Pakistan, is it against the law to preach Christianity on the streets or in the public places? Yes. So you can get thrown in jail. Yes. And then in jail, you might get beaten up there. Well, this Or worse. The, well, a new law that they passed is called Sharia Law 295C. It's called Blasphemy Law. And I want to read uh, something about it, what, what it means. Uh, they just did it uh, in, in 80s. They passed this one in 80s. Uh, conversion are not illegal, but proselytizing among Muslims is prohibited. That's how they interpret that, that yeah, so, law. So proselytizing is prohibited? Yes. You can't do it at all? No. But no. They, do they tell you what the consequences are? Just yes. They say all Pakistani citizens are subject to a form of Sharia law which was introduced in 1991. These laws are based on Islamic laws and are not supposed to apply to non-Muslims. Despite this fact, these laws have been applied in dispute between Muslims and non-Muslims. And there are so many examples I can read to you that how this uh, law has been applied and how many people have been killed and they're in jail. Do you have a Do you have one example here? You yes, I have a lot of examples. I have here. Yeah, let's hear a couple of them. Okay, okay. if you want to, know, it's called a law currently known the Book Section 295C of the Penal Code applies a death sentence 
to anyone who defiles the name of the Prophet Muhammad. This law only requires the testimony of four Muslims for a conviction. It, it laws like this as the lack of power, proper law enforcement that encourages and, and environments where Muslims feel free to use intimidation and violence against religious minorities for personal gain as illustrated above which I said uh, you know, how they, they can use against personal uh, reasons and, and put you into trouble sometimes you are killed in the jail while you are waiting for the trial. Well it almost sounds like if they just need four Muslims to testify against you you could have a gang and they could just falsely accuse you of something and you could be convicted and lose everything and they might be able to gain something out of it. Yes, sure. For example, I'll read a couple of uh, <clears throat> examples from, from what I have in front of me in this uh, report uh, done by the uh, Christian group called uh, International Christian Concerns uh, and it's about the persecution of all the Christians in all over the world, but especially in Pakistan that I'm going to read. And they have a website, it looks like, yes. persecution.org, yes, International org. Christian Concern. And the source they have is CIA World Factbook 2001. January 13, 2002, a bomb exploded inside a Christian church at G-8 Christian Colony in Islamabad. The roof of the building collapsed, causing great structural damage. No one was in church at that time when the bomb went off. In November of 2001, Vahid Paul, a Catholic Christian, was shot to death as he traveled to his job in Peshawar. And you just have a long I list, have a long you list read of, and read and I read. can read and read, it's of nine pages, and I can give it to you in, in, in detail by, by number. They call. Well, I, I know that the, that big thing that was really all over the world in the global news when those guys on machine guns, in I mean, uh, uh, motorcycles with machine guns went into and yes. machine gun people in a Christian Sunday morning service. Yes. Just walked in there and started machine gunning people while they were in the pews. Yes. And I'm going to read that one here. He says, October, the incident that happened was October 28, 2001. Five masked gunmen with bags of guns and bullets, AK-47, rushed into St. Dominic's Church and opened fire on 60 to 100 worshippers, murdering 16 people and screaming graveyard of Christian and Pakistan and Afghanistan. This is just a start that what they were saying while they were shooting the, the innocent children, men and women. And they said, Allahu Akbar, God is great. And they were uh, saying that uh, trying to pronounce that as if they're doing a good act towards God. You're doing Allah God a favor. Yeah, yes, Allah Akbar, that's what they meant. They're doing God a favor. And four church, uh, children, four women, and eight men were slain in attack, including the pastor by name Emmanuel and Muslim police officer Muhammad Salim. On the bullet, real war was above the bodies, a biblical Apathy was painted in red. We want peace, order, and harmony. So this is what they're doing in Pakistan. Every, I mean, I can read to you how they have uh, persecuted young women and, and men. The, how they have uh, beaten them up, you know, stripped them naked, the women, mm -hmm. and taken, you know, shaved their heads mm -hmm. because they just accused them for something which they were not. Uh, they did not even commit the crime. Now, you were there for 33 years. You're mentioning, and you just got pages and pages and pages of these kinds of examples, some of which we've heard of in the news and some we haven't. But uh, from your personal experience and from your own family ties there, you still have family in Pakistan, right? Yes, do. Uh, yes, yes. Yes, uh, have you ever experienced uh, personally from your family, any violence that may have ended up in the death of somebody based on this Islamic persecution? Yeah, actually, one of my family members has been murdered brutally. And, and mutil mutil his body was mutilated. 
uh, his uh, neck was cut uh, and uh, the dagger was put in his heart there was a big hole in his heart and belly was cut and all the intestines were uh, thrown out of his stomach uh, and his body was thrown in a storage room where my younger brother found after 24 hours of his murder i mean this is personal persecution that i have experienced in my own life very recently and 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 I can I can imagine the pains of all those who have lost in Bahawalpur and and in Sialkot and Peshawar and Mardan and and all over the Pakistan areas where where Muslim persecute uh, poor Christians. Sometimes they are not even at fault. Most of the time they are not at fault. Most of them they are not at fault. It's just because they want to prove their point that either you become Muslim or or you suffer these consequences. So you're saying in this case where you lost a personal family member, it was mainly because the Muslims killed him because he was a Christian. Yes. And they wanted him to convert? No, to because he was doing good for the poor Muslims there. And they interpreted as if he was trying to convert them, which he did not. For, for so many years he was helping the poor and, and outcast of, of the country which were Muslims, not Christians. Mm -hmm. And they thought, they construed that as a threat is because a threat. he's helping people. Yes. And they're thinking, okay, he's helping these poor folks and they're going to convert to Christianity because of his example. Yes. And so they felt they better do God a favor mm -hmm. by killing him off. Because he's an infidel and is doing something against Islam. And now, uh, do you have any other uh, personal examples of... Uh, maybe relatives that might have been affected by this? Well, my, my wife's cousin a couple of years ago was brutally murdered. They could not find his body for five days. Young man, in 20s, I think. His body was cut into pieces. I don't know how many pieces, I don't even remember. And put in a plastic bag and thrown in a, in a garbage dumpster. And they kept looking and looking and one day somebody said there's some body found and they went and looked and it was him because the, the way they recognized him was his tooth was uh, broken and that's how they found out that it was him after five days. So my wife's side, they have uh, lost a cousin who was brutally murdered. His own brother was shot uh, some time ago in the stomach. He was beaten up so many times because he was trying to, to protect the Christian youth. And it's, any time something happens, his brother is taken to the jail. And they ask money. They, they lost, my wife has lost their homes, all the bank money, the car, they, they had a car at home. The whole family is distorted. The father died because of the pains that all that money that he made and he lost in this because the police brutality because police comes and picks this guy up and say okay now you are culprit because since you are uh, uh, part of the gang they, they involve him in some kind of gang is to make money out of you because that's another thing that they do to the Christians they catch them and take them to the police station beat them up and then this they and then they demand money from the parents and because they love the children so much, the parents have to borrow money or sell whatever they have, give the money to the police so that they can have the child back. Mm -hmm. And my wife has suffered so much, just like me. Man, it's, it's hard to imagine from over here where we're talking right now, this kind of persecution is going on. Uh, because when we watch the news, and even uh, what I'm hearing now, it's almost like a mantra. Islam is peace. I hear it from the politicians. Mm -hmm. I hear it from uh, different religious leaders. I hear Islam is peace, and, and we're we're loving people, and and <clears throat> and all these types of things. But it doesn't sound like that from what you're telling me here, from a personal perspective of Pakistan. It sounds like it's almost the exact opposite of of peace. Uh, I'm starting to wonder if 
if, if Islam is peace, it's only peace for someone who's a Muslim. <laughs> If you're not a Muslim, you're going to get no peace until you become a Muslim. Yes. Uh, to add to to add to that brutality, and I was talking to to my brother-in-law one time, and he was telling me uh, how he was treated while he was in the custody, and he was telling me uh, they they put him on a on ice and beat him up. They they hang him and beat him up, or they put some kind of uh, uh, jalapeno in the in his but. Uh, just to torture him and and ask him to say yes he has done those crimes so that they can make money so these kind of things they go through I mean this is the truth I, I don't want uh, it, it hurts me to speak about it because what he told me what what he went through and what my brother told me when my younger brother when he saw my brother's body it, I feel like crying oh, how brutal these people are just because you are Christian and you are powerless and you have uh, no political strength and you have no uh, economic strength that you can fight with these uh, Muslim groups or organizations or individuals in this case. My brother, baby brother was uh, robbed. He had a small business in the middle of the city, middle of the day, the two gunmen came. They beat him up and his partner, they were both Christians. There were other people there in the whole building. There are how many hundreds and hundreds of shops. And the business that he's running, there are the two shops of the same kind of business. They did not rob them. They came to his office, beat him up, him and his partner, uh, took all the inventory that he had, all the money, all the jewelry, whatever he had of the family, and left him with nothing. And my brother was so much traumatized that for six to eight months he did not get out of the house. Mm. It's a traumatic experience that's difficult to, to overcome. So when you were looking at Pakistan, we're looking at this, this Islamic presence and this uh, second-class citizenship thrown on the Christians and Hindus and anyone else. In fact, it reminds me of how I've read in newspaper reports how m Hindus and Muslims are fighting and killing each other in different places around the world. It always seems like a lot of this violence is directly related to Islam. Now, in Pakistan, what uh, you already mentioned the percentages of the Sunnis and the Shiites and, and so forth, but is this kind of a prevalent trait of this violence and persecution of Christians among the different Muslim groups? Or is there any Muslim group that treats Christians or uh, others better? Or is it about the same among the different Muslim groups? Uh, from my experience, majority of the Muslims have the same notion and they treat the Christians and, and non-Muslims same way that I described earlier. So it's almost a cultural it's thing. It's a cultural thing. It's, it's, it's just, uh, you, of course, there are always individuals here and there who are sympathetic to, or some percentage who are sympathetic to Christians because Christians run uh, institutions, education institutions. and. and and hospitals, mm -hmm. and the ones who go to the which is three percent, I would call two to three percent of uh, population from my country who uh, intend or wish to go to this English medium schools we call it, and they are the ones who are sympathetic somewhat to mm -hmm. the Christians because of advantages that they have mm -hmm. going to in English medium schools and after that coming to the West for education. Mm -hmm. So that's why they're sympathetic, not because they love Christianity or Christians, because they love to have those Christians who are providing those advantages for them. I see. So, so what you, what I guess we can basically surmise from all this terrible persecution and the stories you brought up and, and your personal experience here, is this is a direct result of the Islamic religion. These people are getting these attitudes about beating you up, persecuting you, killing people, trying to get you to convert to Islam, that is coming directly from the Islamic religious writings. It's not just something that these people made up on their own. It's something that they are getting from the Islamic teachings themselves. Sure. And uh, for our viewers, would you like to mention any, any of these Islamic teachings that may go along these lines? Well, if you really look in the Quran, they... They usually, Islam cannot live by, with other religion. That's, that's for sure. Because 
Christianity and Islam cannot live in peace. If we see the history of, 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 uh, of our human society after Islam came into being, wherever Islam went, they always either ask you to become Muslim or pay jizya, uh, a tax that, that non-Muslim had to pay to, to have a right to live in that area. So to back up my, my, my statement, it's all in the Quran. Muhammad said that you have to either become Muslim or pay jizya. Uh, this is w what I think is uh, very important to know to the audience uh, because many times we hear that Islam is a peaceful religion and, and is, is the same God that we believe in, Islam believes in. But I think the understanding of God in Christianity is completely different than the understanding of God in Islam. Well, just hearing all that you've related so far, especially from personal experience, how people are spitting in your face, killing, mutilating, uh, attacking for any, you know, you, they kick you in for just because your feet are pointed towards Mecca or something. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, this is so alien to what we find in the, 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 the Bible. The yeah. Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, you know, says we're to love our enemies yes. and, uh, and and treat those that despitefully use us in a, in a, in a nice manner. And, uh, it, the the code of ethics yes. and morality is so different from what from what you find in Islam. Mm -hmm. You almost wonder how could it be the same God? How could the God that's saying one thing here in the Bible is saying to do something so completely different? in this other religious book. And uh, just for a, a quick reference here, I, while, while you were talking there, I pulled out my Quran and yes. I uh, found a reference in Surah chapter 8, verse 60. It says, Against them make ready your strength to the utmost of your power, including steeds of war, to strike terror into the hearts of the enemies of God and your enemies, and others besides, whom ye may not know, but whom God did know. And uh, it goes on to say uh, in uh, Surah 9, verse 5, But when the forbidden months are past, then fight and slay the pagans wherever you find them, and seize them, beleaguer them, and lie in wait for them in every stratagem of war, but if they repent and establish regular prayers and practice regular charity, then open the way for them. I guess what that means is if they turn to become Muslims and repent. Yes. Otherwise, it's a struggle. There's a war going war. on here yes. against these people. Make them pay the tax. Yes. Uh, there's all kinds of references I could bring up. We've already done several uh, television shows yes. along, on the lines of Islam. Those that are interested can contact our ministry uh, for that, but we'll bring that up at the end of the program. Okay. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, Reverend, what were you going to uh, say about this uh, Islamic concept? Of, uh, of uh, why they persecute us. That's, that's what I'm trying to uh, bring out this. Can a, can a Muslim live peacefully with, with, with a non-Muslim? And that's that's the struggle all the Muslims have, not only in Pakistan, but all over the world. Because, as uh, Brother Larry has said it in from the Quran, that uh, there's, there's no peace. Islam is, the meaning of Islam is submission. You submit to the will of God, and will of the God, according to Islamic understanding, is to make the whole world Islamic. Because Islam is a religion, according to them, which contains all the best laws and rules to how to live on this earth. And that's why they want to make the whole world Muslim. And when you, if you're a neighbor in my part of the world, and if you're a neighbor of a Muslim, if you're not Muslim, they want you to be Muslim so that they will do a favor to God by making you Muslim, by mm -hmm. force, 
by persecution, by denying your rights or dignity. In other words, it's all right to use different forms of coercion yes. to make you become a Muslim. Yes. But why aren't we hearing this in our Western news uh, media or our politicians? Uh, is this just, let me put it this way, yes. is this just a, a limited example? I mean, here we have Pakistan, that's where you're from, 33 years of Pakistan, you have yes. relatives and everything still there. Uh, is this something that just has only happened in Pakistan? We don't really see this kind of thing happening anywhere else where Islam is. It's just something restricted to your, ne your neck of the woods. Is that an accurate statement? I think wherever the Islamic world is, it's like Indonesia, what's happening in Indonesia? Mm -hmm. What is happening in the Philippines? What is happening in, in Malaysia? So wherever the Muslims are, it is very difficult. Like for example, in, in, in America, any Muslim who comes into, in, into America, he by the law, he has a right to have his religion. What kind of uh, food he wants to eat, what kind of practices he wants to have, what kind of values he wants to practice. You are free to do it as long as you are not interfering with others or, or not mm -hmm. going against the law. You can build your mosque, you can build your religious schools, you have so many big universities here. But in Pakistan, you cannot even do all those things unless you get special permission from the government or from the local authority. Mm -hmm. Now, when I look at the passages in the Quran, and I'd like you to comment on this, yeah, just just a, just references like this all over the place. But in Surah 930, and that's uh, page 448 in my Yusuf Ali translation of the Holy Quran, uh, it says Jews and Christians are cursed. Now, why would Muhammad say something like that? Or is that doesn't? When I talk to Muslims, sometimes mm -hmm. they they get defensive, and they say, well. That doesn't really mean they're cursed. Uh, that's something that maybe back then they might have thought that, but nowadays we don't really go along with that. That doesn't mean that at all. But uh, from your understanding of, and you even went to uh, Islamic schools that were teaching you Islamic teachings. Yes. How would you interpret Jews and Christians are cursed? The way it is written, exactly the way it is written and said. Because that's what I was told all the time through my high school years that I'm cursed. I'm kafir. Kafir is infidel. The kafir means is infidel. And the, and the connotation of kafir is you are a dirty person. You are an you are unclean person unless you become Muslim. And that's exactly what it means, cursed. Kafir means you're a cursed person. So when you're cursed, that means you can be treated like dirt. Dirt, yeah, because you are dirt. And uh, so... Whenever a country gets taken over by Muslim uh, uh, authorities or whatever that are believing what this book says, then things can start to get very uncomfortable for non-Muslim minorities. And we don't really hear that that much these days. I'm going to read some from the Quran. I have an excerpt from the Quran. Surah 8 and verse 16 says, Strike terror into the hearts of the enemies of Allah and your enemy, means Prophet Muhammad's enemy. Yeah, that's what I just read a while ago. Yeah, and then I'm going to continue in Surah 9, verse 14 says, Fight, which means kill them, which means non-Muslims. And Allah will punish, torment them by your hands. Cover them with shame. Now this is the struggle that every Muslim goes through when he has to live with a non-Muslim neighbor, that how to live in peace. Mm -hmm. And Surah 8, verse 12 and 17 says, I will instill terror into the hearts of unbelievers, smite ye above their necks, and smite all the fingertips of them. It is not ye who slew them, it was Allah who did it. So that's the struggle Muslim has to go through. Yeah, if he wants to be a faithful Muslim, yes. and follow what he sees in his Quran, then he he may like you personally, but he's being told by his holy book mm -hmm. to do these things you just described. Yes. And that almost fosters this kind of persecution you've been describing all through the show. Yes. It's a, it's a, there's a, another surah, surah 929, 
page 447, and this, this uh, Yusuf Ali translation says, fight the Christians and the Jews. Yes. And you get more references like that in Surah 47.4, and, uh, and that's a reference there to the unbelievers and the kafir, mm -hmm. as you were just mentioning. Yes. You fight them, you slay them, you battle them, you uh, strike terror in their hearts, you put them to shame, yes. and all these and things. And put a heavy burden of, uh, of texts, Jezia and, and, and Prophet Muhammad's time. Because of that submission. They want you in submission yes. underneath them. Yes. There's not, there's, I guess the, the, the human bill of rights here in America wouldn't really apply in a Muslim fundamentalist state uh, where every man has equal rights in the sight of God. It doesn't really work out that way. Well, sometimes it, sometime it can be on the paper, but practice could be different, which is, mm -hmm. you know, which is happening in Pakistan. I see. Yes, they might have in the paper, but in practice, it's nil. Right. And yeah. that's why, like, like not, in Pakistan, we have a, a separate electorates. Uh, that means I, as a Christian, cannot elect a Muslim leader. I have to elect only a Christian leader. So the Muslim electoral uh, person, a person who wants to be the minister, he can ignore me and ignore my rights because he doesn't need my vote. Now this proves the second class uh, right. citizen. You know, I can only vote or elect a Christian member who has very little authority. Now, you know, I've been watching a lot of news because of different events. I mean, not a whole lot. I don't like to watch television very much. But anyway, when I have watched the news and they're talking about Islam, uh, and they'll have an Islamic representative or an imam from some mosque somewhere here in America or whatever. And it's always this usual whitewash of Islam being so nice and peaceful and loving people and, and respecting human rights and all the stuff that I hear constantly like a mantra from the different news channels and, and whoever's being interviewed. But there is one Quranic verse they bring up, and I'd like you to talk about it. I'll, I'll probably talk about it myself too, but in Surah 2, 256, it says, let there be no compulsion in religion. And I, and I don't see that much news, but it's like I've seen, I hear them saying that one little verse again and again and again, and yet I never hear them say any of these other things that we've been mentioning, and we're only mentioning a few of them. Now, what do you have to say? You probably heard this too. Let there yes. be no compulsion in yes. religion. Yes. So, but there are many ways of comp uh, uh, forcing people. Mm -hmm. now, for example, denying their rights as a human. Mm -hmm. Denying uh, education in their institutions. Denying freedom of religion. Denying their right to have uh, good jobs in the in the garments. Now these all you are, you are forcing people to go towards where you want. So in other words, when they quote that verse, they interpret it in such a way as where they're still doing what you're talking yes, about. Yes. Yes. But it sounds good for PR purposes. Yeah, people. Yes. When they're trying to tell you, especially Westerners over here who don't have a Clue. Have no, they don't have a clue. Yes, the don't. kind of persecution and, and and terrible living conditions you're talking about for minorities in an Islamic state such as Pakistan. Now I understand there's other, there's more secularized uh, states like Turkey that aren't yes. exactly like that. But we're talking about uh, Islamic governments uh, in countries that really take this Quran a lot more serious and they use the Syria and the, and the Hadiths to back up their laws and yes. and they really get into it. So that compulsion thing is... Uh, just one out of many other things that they don't speak of. They just use this one word to prove their points and, and calm down the situation right, in because, the West. Because they know most Westerners are ignorant. Yes. They're ignorant about what we're talking about yes. here. They, they don't know Islam, they don't know Quran, they don't know right. Hadith or Sunha or Sharia. So, so when a Muslim can just say something like that verse I just, I just quoted. Well, they pretty much know that Westerners is going to take that for what he's saying. Yes. And that will be pretty much the end of it. Yes. And, and that could be only one in the Quran that is saying that there's no compulsion of religion. 
The rest, if you read in the Quran, there's so many ways. Oh yeah, in the Quran, he, I think in some cases, uh, Muhammad would give you three choices. Yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. He gave you three choices. Three choices, yes. And uh, you had to pick one of them, you know. Yes. Either convert or pay the tax. Or die. Or die, yes. And, uh, and, and that's, that, that's some choice. And that's no choice. <laughs> like in Hadith, uh, I would like to uh, read uh, from Al-Bukhari, volume... One and uh, number 25, uh, it says, it goes like this, Muhammad once was asked, what is the best deed for the Muslim next to believing in Allah and his apostle? And his answer was, to participate in jihad in Allah's cause. Now, you can interpret in many ways this thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is jihad? And how can you participate? Many times, I heard that people say, oh, most of the Muslims are moderate Muslims. They don't believe these extremist ideas and they don't share this. But I say, okay, if you don't share it, why don't you say or write against it? Because there are many ways of participating. One way of doing is to do yourself mm -hmm. in jihad, participate. One way is to, uh, other, second way is to, to, to give something in, in the cause of jihad. And the third way for me is to keep quiet and say and do nothing about it when people are being persecuted in the name of jihad. So you are still participating in it. Right. And by just being quiet. Just being quiet. And quiet letting letting, letting it, go. it go. Right. And which they don't speak about. It. And they say, oh, we are the moderates. If you're moderate, why don't you speak about it? Mm -hmm. why, you can, why don't you condemn those things mm -hmm. and, and help those who are being persecuted in the name of Islam? Mm -hmm. So that means you are being equally participating in it for not doing anything against it. And uh, that, like you just mentioned, the, the, the definition of jihad can mean a lot of different things to different people and Muslims. But this is almost where you can almost see a connection with this terrorist yes. situation we're, we're dealing with dealing around with the world. Exactly. Because those guys are taking jihad to, I think, at least from my reading of the Quran and the Hadith, to its logical conclusion. In fact, I almost would think because uh, Muhammad himself led a, a bunch of invasions, led a, yes. fought in a bunch of battles, mm -hmm. captured a lot of people, took slaves, and, and uh, talks all about war and, and mm -hmm. how to spread the religion with a sword. Yeah. If Muhammad was alive today, I almost think uh, when they got a clandestine video of, let's say, someone like Osama bin Laden, that Muhammad would be sitting right there with him. <laughs> and he'd be, he'd be plotting with him on what they could do next to spread Islam. Well, if That's you, my opinion. Yes, but yes. Uh, it seems logical based on what I'm reading. You know, I mean, you, you, you look at different things where in Surah 5, 33, Muhammad says that execution, crucifixion, cutting off of hands and feet uh, for those who wage war, against Allah. Allah. You see, so here, and when you read the Hadith in, in one of our previous uh, shows on Islam, mm -hmm. you know, Muhammad uh, said that, you know, he had guys' eyes burned out, he had their hands chopped off, uh, you know, he, he, he had them die of thirst. Uh, he did all kinds of things, and this is what's admitted in the al-Bukhari Hadith straight up. <laughs> well, I have a... a, a a kind of a reading from from biography written by Ibn Hashim is the biographer of Prophet Muhammad who gives a, a, a how Muhammad indirectly participated in the killing of the non-Muslims of his time so if you have time I can read it or go ahead because we still got a few minutes left in the okay program. and it's an expert from that in by Ibn Hashim's uh, biography on Prophet Muhammad, volume 2, page 40 and 41. It says the following is, is just one example of jihad from the life of the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad. After the war of the trench, in which Muhammad was besieged by the Qurayshites, led by Abu Sufyan, it was alleged that the Jewish tribe Bani Qurayza agreed to provide help from within to Abu Sufyan's forces. Although the alleged help did not materialize and the siege eventually ended, nevertheless, Muhammad never forgave them 
for their willingness to help his enemies. Muslims turned against Bani Kureza and blocked their streets for 12, uh, 25 days. The Jewish tribe expressed readiness to accept surrender, to give up their belongings, and to depart from their homes. Muhammad, however, would not consent to this, and instead appointing as an arbiter, Saad ibn Mu'az, a man who was known to be on bad terms with Bani Kureza. Saad ruled that all Bani Kureza's men should be beheaded, that the women and children should be sold as slaves, and that all their property should be divided among the Muslims. Trenches were dug in the bazaar of Medina for disposal of the 900 Jewish bodies whom Muhammad had spent the previous night slaughtering. Now, this export is taken from uh, the biography written by Ibn Hashim on, on Prophet Muhammad, volume 2, page 40 and 41. So you can see from, from the beginning of Islam, from the start of Islam, how non-Muslim was treated. Right. Uh, as I've uh, read the Hadith, reading the Quran, uh, what I think we're dealing with in this modern American culture that we find ourselves in right now is that people are just ignorant of what Islam really stands for. They're just accepting all these nice words and things that people are saying about Islam. But if they stop and do a little research and read, read the Quran, yes. check out the Hadith, mm -hmm. it's all right there. I'm sure if, if, if I was trying in Muhammad's time, you know, the great prophet Muhammad, and, and uh, Brother Salim and me were trying to do this kind of stuff with Muhammad around, I'm sure he wouldn't just have us beheaded. We'd be no telling what he would have done to us first. According to the Hadith, he might have done a number of things to us before he even killed us. Illus, yes, that's you know, right. torture us of all kinds of things. Oh, yes. and, and when you mentioned some of the brutality uh, to some of the other people you mentioned earlier, it almost ties into the examples that we uh, would see that Muhammad would do to some of the people he didn't like, yes. some of the people he had assassinated, uh, some of the people he had killed in one way or another. Uh, it all starts to make sense when you look at terrorists around the world, for instance, and a lot of them just, it's not a coincidence that they're Muslims. Yes. <laughs> You know, people don't, they got to start thinking. Thinking, yes. It's not just a PR campaign with guys saying, well, there's a verse in the Quran that says there's no compulsion in religion. And, and you have that one little verse and, oh, that makes everything all right. Yes. No, it's, that's not. Because that's, maybe that's the only one in the Quran that says no compulsion. But rest of the Quran, if you read. Well, even I've had a lot of Muslims say, "Well, that verse has been abrogated." Yeah, yes. Well, so then, see, they they abrogate anything they anything want to they abrogate want. Yes. anyway. And abrogation means take out. Yes. That's where you get the satanic verses from and things of yes. that nature. Exactly. So when you have a religion like this, where you can put in and take out whatever you feel like, well, then anything goes. Well, we're basically out of time. I want to thank you, uh, Brother Salim Masi, for being with us. Uh, our viewers at home, I'd like you to know you can contact our ministry, Christian Answers. We have newsletter. You get our mailing list. Call our number. We got our website, uh, email address. Uh, contact us. We've got tracks and literature on Islam free of charge. Uh, anything we can help you with. But uh, for now, just remember what Jesus said. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Not Muhammad, not by a jihad but by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us. Be with us again next time. God bless. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine 
proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 